Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Grant, and I am the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee known as the Dr. Cog TAC. I call to order the March 27, 2023 Dr. Cog TAC meeting at 1.32 p.m. Thank you for joining us today on this live stream meeting format. Participants may have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. Please make sure that your typed name reflects your first and last name and your representation at this time. We ask that those intending to speak use the raise hand button to raise a question or a comment on an agenda item. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the Q&A box. As a reminder, during the business agenda, TAC members and alternates can speak or ask questions. Members of the public may speak during public comment. At this time, um, we will call the roll. And Cam, will you be able to help us out with uh, calling attendees? Absolutely, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, so for current members and alternates that I see, uh, I see Deborah Basket, Frank Bruno, Alex Hyde Wright, Art Griffith, Brooke Spoboda, uh, Bryce Hammerton, Carson Priest, Chris Hudson, uh, Don Sluter, uh, Frank Bruno, Jim Eusen, Jordan Rudel, Justin Schmitz, Kristen Kenyon, Mac Callison, Maria De Andre, uh, Michelle Melikonis, uh, Mike Whitaker, Rick Pilgrim, Ron Papsdorf, Sarah Grant, Tom Moore, and Tom Reif. Those are all of the members I see at this moment, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Cam. Uh, Do we get everybody? They're still coming in. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Well, those that are coming in, um, if we didn't catch you on the roll call, please do email Cam at ckennedy at drcog.org so your name can be added for the record. And at this time, um, I'd like to turn over to Jacob to introduce a few new members. Yep, thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have one new member and two new alternates today I'd like to introduce from the Regional Air Quality Council, or RAC. We have a new member, Tom Moore. Welcome, Tom, and a new alternate, Mike Silverstein. And then for the Boulder County contingent, we have a new alternate, Michelle Melanakis. And Michelle, I hope I said your name correctly, but welcome as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wonderful. Welcome, Tom, Mike, and Megan. We will proceed now to public comment. We'll open to the meeting for public comment. Public is limited to three minutes. And after the public comment period is over, only TAC members and alternates will be able to partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. Please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we'll call on you to begin speaking. If you've joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we'll call on you by your last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You'll have three minutes to speak after which we will ask you to wrap up. As a reminder all, after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will be able to partake in the discussion. Do we have any public comment at this time? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna give it a second, but I currently do not see any hands raised at this time. Thank you, Cam. I do not see any hands raised at this time either. Thank you very much. At this time, we'll move on to the February 27th TAC meeting summary. Is there any discussion or corrections or questions about the February 27th, 2023 TAC meeting? If so, please raise your hand to speak um, if you have a question or correction. I am not seeing any hands at this time. Let's give it a moment. Appearing that there is none, uh, the minutes are approved and we will move on to the next agenda item. So the first item on our agenda and our only action item for the day, item four, fiscal year 2022, fiscal year 2023 unified planning work program, UPWP amendments. I'll pass it over to Jacob Rieger, multimodal transportation planning manager. Thank you, Madam Chair. So yeah, this is our only action item today. It's a relatively quick amendment, but we wanted to be transparent about um, our request to amend the current um, Unified Planning Work Program or UPWP. Uh, we do amend the UPWP occasionally as needed. This particular amendment addresses um, our desire and our intent to apply for 
grants that we're, you know, applicable grants that we're eligible for under the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, of course, we mentioned the bipartisan infrastructure law and some of the specific grant programs throughout the current UPWP. Uh, we also mentioned generally that we'll use consultant assistance as needed um, in support of our planning activities. But at the request of our Federal Highway Administration planning partners, um, they asked us to just be a little bit more explicit about our intent, uh, specifically to apply for bipartisan infrastructure law grants, um, and that we may use consultant assistance to kind of help us do that. Um, and in fact, we have an RFP out, uh, did have an RFP out on the street. It actually just closed uh, for consultant proposals uh, to provide on-call grant writing support for us uh, to apply for grants under the BIL. So um, you can see the uh, language of the amendment on the screen, but it's simply just saying that, uh, that we are going to apply for BIL grants um, and that we will use consultant assistance to help us do that. So that's all we have on this amendment. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jacob. Do we have any questions or comments for Mr. Rieger? Seeing none, um, we will now entertain a motion. Sorry, I don't see any hands raised. Uh, Mr. Hyde-Wright. I will move to approve the proposed amendment to the fiscal year 2022 through 2023 UPWP as stated. Thank you, Mr. Hyde-Wright. Uh, Ms. Basket. Ms. Basket. I will second that motion. Thank you, Ms. Basket. Uh, any discussion? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying no. Any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you. Right. Okay, um, informational briefings. Uh, item number five is the Colorado Statewide Transportation Electrification Briefing. This is attachment C in your packet. And I will hand it over to Emily Lindsay, Active and Emerging and Mobility Programs Manager. Thank you. I'm Emily Lindsay, I'm with Dr. Cog, and I am pleased to have um, online with us Mike King from Colorado Trans Department of Transportation. He is CDOT's Assistant Director of Electrification and Energy and will provide an overview of transportation electrification efforts um, in the region and across Colorado. So without further ado, Mike, I believe you're on. Yes, can you hear me? I can. Yes, you can. Right. So you should also be seeing my slides right now. Please let me know if you don't. And thank you very much for inviting me today to give an overview of some of CDOT's and the state of Colorado's electric vehicle programs. Uh, I'm going to try to move through the slides somewhat quickly to leave time for discussion and questions at the end. And I'll try to give an overview of all of the work that our Office of Innovative Mobility and our partners at other state agencies, local governments, and the private sector are doing around the state. So without further ado, so the CDOT Office of Innovative Mobility uh, consists of four groups that you should see on the screen there. We have our Division of Transit and Rail, which of course uh, has existed for, for a long while at the state. Um, but as of 2019, that has been combined with three other units or pillars as we sometimes call them. Mobility services, mobility technology, which includes connected and automated vehicle programs, and then electrification and energy, which is what we'll be talking about today. And then within our electrification work, we uh, tend to break it into five different focus areas that you see listed. Uh, charging infrastructure, transit electrification, medium and heavy duty electrification, education and awareness, and zero emission vehicle or ZEV workforce development. So to set the stage, you know, why, why is the state of Colorado doing this work in the first place? Uh, a lot of it does come back to our statewide GHD reduction targets 
These were put into statute by House Bill 191261. You can see the targets on the side there, uh, the percent reductions by certain future years. And these are all from a 2005 baseline. If you look at the pie chart, you'll note that transportation is the single largest contributing sector to GHG in Colorado, as it is nationally at this point. And a lot of that is because the electricity sector over the past decades has gotten cleaner, especially with the addition of much more renewables, as well as the replacement of coal with natural gas on a lot of the grid. And so not only is transportation our biggest um, contributor at this point, but the electrification of transportation offers us the ability to leverage some of those gains in the energy sector uh, by, by you know, basically piggybacking on them if we electrify transportation systems. All of the uh, parts of this pie are being addressed by different elements at the state level that are part of our GHG pollution reduction roadmap. Uh, but here at CDOT, of course, transportation is our main focus. So electrification of vehicles is not by any means the only way to reduce GHG in the transportation sector. Of course, we have transit, we have bike and pedestrian investment, we have tra uh, transportation demand management. Um, but since the topic today is electrification, I'll focus on some of the targets there, understanding that this is not by itself sufficient to reach our GHG goals. Uh, we have, as of 2020, our electric vehicle plan as a state, we have a target of 940,000 registered zero emission vehicles to be on the road by 2030. We've also had a target uh, over the last couple of years of at least 1,000 transit zero emission vehicles in that same year. And most recently, the clean truck strategy that was completed in 2021 identified a target of 35,000 medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicles in that same year. So we're trying to move all of those different sectors at the same time, given that they have very different challenges, very different technologies involved. Uh, the targets are, are different, but uh, we're, we're trying to take a holistic approach to the statewide fleet overall. And we also have some other targets within CDOT that are more specific to our own infrastructure. Uh, one of those is we're attempting to electrify all 26 of the scenic and historic byways in the state so that we can support uh, EV-based tourism and local economic development in rural areas. And we're also trying to ensure that 100% of the state highway system is within 30 miles of a DC fast charger. So not just that we build a lot of charging, but that the charging is accessible in every part of the state to all the different potential users. And I'll show you some maps later in the presentation that kind of indicate where we are in those targets right now. So it's also really important to note that a lot of this work is driven by and made possible by the fact that the automakers are really investing very heavily in electrification of their vehicles. Um, many people are aware of the fact that the Ford F-150 Lightning sales began last year. That's F-150 being the most popular vehicle in the United States for more than 40 years. And now that there is an electric pickup truck model and specifically the, the F-150, uh, that's a big deal in terms of the, the direction of the overall market. You can see the commitments from several of the other major automakers there, GM pledging to be 100% electric by 2035, other, others uh, pledging to have hybrids, electric, and or hydrogen vehicles on the road in future years. And in Colorado, it's always worth noting that the Subaru, uh, both hybrid and electric versions um, of every model uh, that is a big deal given the status of the, the Subaru brand in Colorado. So I won't dwell too much on this, but it's important to understand that the state of Colorado has uh, state tax incentives to support the purchase or lease of battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids. There are also federal tax incentives, which are being changed right now as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act but that these things can be combined to bring down the purchase price of electric vehicles, which is, of course, one of the major barriers for consumers at this point. And then there are also a number of electric utilities that offer different incentives and programs to ease the transition. Most notably for Dr. Cog, XL Energy has a lot of programs that consumers and businesses can take advantage of. So this is just a, one category of uh, attempting to make it more feasible for people to afford an electric option for their next vehicle, uh, which is a big part of the equation, but not in and of itself sufficient. 
The current status in the state, you can see, um, excuse me while I minimize the window here, we have um, actually more than 78,000 electric vehicles on the road at this point. Um, I've seen the numbers that were updated uh, recently. We're, we're above 80 at this point. Um, prob probably not surprising that most of the front range, many in the Dr. Cog counties, um, but we are also seeing growth in other parts of the state as there are more models, more variety of trucks, SUVs, and other longer range models coming to market. Um, but yes, you can see also the breakdown that about two thirds of our vehicles or more in the state are battery electric vehicles or BEVs. The remainder are plug-in hybrid electric vehicles that can function both on battery alone or on gasoline engines. And again, our target is 940,000 by 2030. So a long way off from our current numbers, but we are seeing a rapid increase in adoption that makes us think that that uh, target is achievable. One, one way to look at this nationally is that we are typically around six in the nation for the rate of adoption and the total number of plug-in electric vehicle registrations. Um, last year, as I'll mention in the next slide, uh, we actually surpassed 10% of all new vehicle sales in Colorado being electric vehicles of some form or another, which is a major milestone that we, we had never passed before and considered by some in the, the national and global market to be a bit of a tipping point that once you get over 10%, it becomes self-sustaining and, and doesn't really uh, dip be out below that again. And this is especially notable in that the overall car sales at the same time uh, were down both nationally and in the state. So there are fewer cars being sold, but a greater percentage of them are electric vehicles. And this is a bit of a longer term trend from 2019 to 2022, the share of the market by powertrain. You can see an obvious dip in the second quarter of 2020, but ever since then we've had pretty strong growth and uh, a very encouraging trajectory in the market. So turning now, you know, vehicles are of course one part of the equation, but charging is a major barrier for many people and for the market as a whole. Um, there are three speeds of charging. Uh, level one charging is essentially a regular plug that you might have in your house that with an adapter can charge uh, almost any electric vehicle, albeit rather slowly, not usable for many people unless they drive very little per day, but always an option for those people um, in an emergency. And this is something that many members of the public don't realize that you can charge an electric vehicle on a regular uh, household plug. Level two is the more common thing that you see in people's homes, at workplaces, apartment buildings. Uh, this requires a, the same plug as you might use for a dryer um, or something in your garage, power tools. Um, so relatively minor uh, upgrade for many homes. Uh, newer homes tend to include them in the garage. And so this is, um, this is the most common option that either people choose to put in their own garage if they have one, uh, or that people who are charging at work or in certain public areas might be taking advantage of. And then DC fast charging, or level three, as it's sometimes called, you know, this is the closest approximation of what you would think of as a gas station experience. Depending on the speed of the charger and the, 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 the rate that the vehicle can accept, you know, you could be looking at between 15 and 45 minutes to go from a mostly empty to a mostly full battery. But the specifics really vary here, and the technology is increasing so rapidly that um, you know, those times are quickly approaching 10 or five minute fill up, which of course then would bring it to more or less equivalence with filling up a gas tank, as, as many people are used to. Um, some of the grant programs in the state of Colorado that help support charging, we've had the Charge Ahead Colorado grants for almost a decade at this point. There are three rounds per year. They range from $9,000 for a single level two installation all the way up to $50,000 or more for DC fast charging. Um, this is a program that is taken advantage of by local governments, uh, businesses, nonprofits. Uh, pretty much anyone other than a private homeowner can use this grant funding. And every time that we have a round of these grants, three times a year through the Colorado Energy Office, we always have you know, two to three times as many requests as we are able to fund. So strong demand, it's been going for a long time and it will continue for a long time in the future. 
Several years back, we made a more focused and um, more uh, targeted effort to build fast charging along major highway corridors in the state through the DC Fast Charging Corridor Grant Program. We invested $10 million, uh, mostly of Volkswagen settlement funding in this, uh, building high-speed charging close to major highways, building in the capacity to upgrade in the future as the speeds and the technologies change, uh, worked with site hosts. Um, the state of Colorado doesn't own or operate any charging beyond our own workplaces. Uh, we partner with private investors, local governments, other site hosts, as we call them, to own and operate the charging uh, on their facilities. And so some of the types of places that you see, Walmarts, Targets, REI, uh, gas stations, local public parking lots in smaller towns, things like that. The, the image you see here is, are the units in Fair Play, Colorado. Uh, this 34 locations were identified in this RFP. 30 of them have now opened and the remaining four, uh, that should say 2023, uh, hoping to have all those remaining four open by the end of this calendar year. And this is a map showing all of the DC fast chargers currently in the state of Colorado. It includes those red dots are the ones that we know are coming because they've been funded through some grant or another, including the one I just mentioned. So four of those locations plus others that we've funded. And uh, you can see that most parts of the state have relatively good coverage at this point compared to what you might expect or what the, you know was the case even a few years ago. But certainly major gaps still existing on the Eastern Plains in the Northwest. And of course, um, even with all those green squares on the Denver Metro, just based on population and travel patterns, we still need quite a few more in that, uh, in that more developed area of the state. This is another visualization of the same. Uh, it includes a 30-mile driving buffer. So as I mentioned before, CDOT is aiming to cover every 100% of the state highway system so that you, as a, as a traveler, you're never more than 30 miles from your closest DC fast charger. And we are about about 73% currently out of 100. We have yearly targets that we try to hit to keep on pace. Our target for 2023 for June 30th is 80%. So we might come very close to, to either missing that by a little bit or you know overtaking it by a little bit. But this is a way to, for us to ensure that we're not just putting charging where there's already charging, but that we're covering new areas of the state, continuing to expand access, not just raw numbers. And as I mentioned, we also have a target to electrify all 25 or 26, excuse me, of our scenic and historic byways. We're currently sitting at 13 of those that you see listed on the side. And the scenic byways program is really interesting because on the one hand, it's a way to put charging in destinations that people with EVs want to travel. That has benefits for them, of course, as users. It also has benefits for local economies because people can now visit those parts of the state, spend their time and spend their money in them. And then by putting charging in for visitors at first, it also serves the longer term goal of making charging accessible for people that live in those rural areas, currently less likely and perhaps less interested in having an EV. But if they start to see charging in their community and in their neighborhood, it makes that choice feasible for them in a way that it currently isn't. So we think this is a really innovative way to connect rural economic development uh, tourism from people in state and out of state, and then also laying the groundwork for greater acceptance and adoption in parts of the state where EV charging is a little bit foreign at this point. So a couple of other things that are happening right now at the national and state level. Um, earlier in the month, the Colorado Energy Office released the DC Fast Charging Plazas program. This is the first round of grants that includes our NEVI funding from the federal government. Uh, $56 million over five years is in that NEVI pot. And then we also have the first inclusion of community access enterprise funding. That's a new funding source at the state level that was created back in 2021 by Senate Bill 260. So the first RFA for that was already released and applications are due May 5th. We expect to have two rounds of applications per year for the next five years. Definitely something for folks in this, uh, this group to check out for future applications. I already mentioned the Charge Ahead Colorado program, three rounds per year, a great fit for smaller businesses, smaller deployments, uh, municipal fleets, a lot of options there. 
Um, so that, that recently closed. There'll be another round opening in the May-June timeframe, and then that will continue as long as, uh, as long as we can continue it, hopefully in perpetuity. Uh, that also includes the funding for the byways and tourism effort that I mentioned. And then most recently, um, just a couple weeks ago, the, uh, the federal authorities announced the release of the Charging and Fueling Infrastructure RFA, CFI. This is a nationally competitive fu uh, funding source. It's sort of the, the partner funds to the NEVI program, which are formula. These are discretionary competitive funds. The first round has $700 million available, competitive across the entire country. Um, but this is interesting because these are funds that the state can apply for, local governments, MPOs, tribal entities can all compete for these funds. There are a number of different categories, community grants, corridor grants, a lot of different focus areas. And this is something, <coughs> excuse me, that Dr. Cog itself or any of the member jurisdictions uh, might consider applying for, and that CDOT would be very happy to work with you on supporting your applications um, if you have an idea that fits into this CFI uh, request for applications, please reach out to me or reach out to anyone you know at CDOT that you want to talk to about that because I think there's a great opportunity for the state of Colorado as a whole to bring extra resources into the state, uh, especially in this first round when many other states in the country are very much focused on getting their NEVI programs out the door. We expect there might be less competition in this first round than in future years. So we really want to strike while the iron is hot. If we have good ideas, we think this is our year to, to make a big ask and get some hopefully very positive awards for Colorado. Um, I'll just share this. This is the map showing our NEVI plans. So these are the corridors that are designated for the NEVI formula program. Those funds are being awarded through the DCFC Plaza's grant that is currently open. So projects can be within one mile of any of the corridors you see here. It's a little bit difficult to see in the Denver Metro, but uh, 285, I-270, uh, US-40, US-85, those are all included, but um, there's a more detailed map on our website. <coughs> and this is a program where we have the opportunity to build new NEVI compliant stations in these dotted red line areas that are um, complete gaps in the charging network, but also to upgrade existing stations like the yellow ones you see, where there is DC fast charging already, but it is not yet at the standard established by the national, uh, the national NEVI standards. So this is an opportunity to build upon our existing network in the state, but also add charging to areas where there's currently none. So uh, moving along to the next sort of category, transit electrification, I won't dwell on all of these items, but we have a lot of funding uh, through the Volkswagen settlement, through the new clean transit enterprise, through federal competitive funds um, from the Federal Transit Administration to bring funding into the state to replace diesel and gasoline transit vehicles with zero emission options, battery electric, hydrogen fuel cell, others. Um, we are able to help fund transit agency planning, facility modifications, charging, and the vehicles themselves. And um, this is an area where there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of partnership with local transit agencies because it's a very complex thing to, uh, to make this transition while maintaining high quality service and reliability. And so the state has a lot of ways to help you do that and we would love to work with you on it. <coughs> Currently, uh, we have 71 operational zero emission buses in the state and we have another 43 that have been awarded and are in some stage of procurement and you can see a few of the, the pictures there uh, from Boulder, from uh, Vail, and from Colorado Springs. Another emerging area are medium and heavy duty vehicles. Uh, so apart from the transit vehicles, which often fall in this category, uh, we've been working with our Colorado freight experts to integrate zero emission vehicle considerations into the next statewide freight plan. Uh, we're working on our own medium and heavy duty fleet at CDOT to figure out where are the best ways to start integrating zero emission options into our fleet. For instance, electric street sweepers are an early uh, focus area as well as hybrid electric bucket trucks that we have a few of it at this point. 
Um, we're working with the Energy Office to create new grant programs specific to medium and heavy duty charging for fleets, but also on highway travel so that we can support that eventual longer haul travel that is currently not really possible with, with battery electric vehicles. And then we recently had an event where we partnered with some folks from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government to do what they call a scrum activity and really dig into some of the challenges for rural electric co-ops, municipal utilities, and other fleets to electrify larger vehicles in more rural settings. And it's really a really specific set of challenges there that we're, we're starting to work through so that we can address that need uh, sooner rather than later. The second to last category is education and awareness. Um, all of these programs can only be so effective if people don't know about them, if people are not interested in EVs, if people are not aware of the resources available to them. So over the last year and a half, we've been working with the Energy Office and other partners on the EV Co campaign. This is a brand neutral Colorado specific electric vehicle education and awareness campaign that launched in November of last year. And I'll show you some images and some materials from that on the next slide. Uh, we're also working internally at CDOT and through our state, part, our state agency partners to educate our own staff on these topics so that they can speak knowledgeably and engage with stakeholders productively in some of these new areas that are not the traditional role of a state DOT, but that we're evolving into. We're working with the Colorado Automobile Dealers Association to support the 2023 Denver Auto Show, which will have a major EV focus for the first time. And we also work with Recharge Coaches, Clean Cities Coalitions, and other nonprofit entities around the state to diffuse this material to the general public since we don't have the bandwidth or the skill set to do that on our own. So here are some examples of some of the education and engagement materials. You can see some of the social media, the, the EV Co branded uh, materials, emphasizing some of the, the benefits of electric vehicles in a kind of brand neutral, um, brand neutral way, talking about convenience, talking about access to the outdoors, we worked with the Auto Dealers Association to take photos, professional photos of new electric vehicle models on our scenic byways. That's the example you see on the center left there of the, the Mustang Mach-E driving in a very scenic background. Those are really useful for all sorts of presentations to get people to understand what, what the modern EV is, not the picture they might have in their mind. And then we do uh, in-person activities, educating our own staff on new electric models or going to public events and talking to people about what they like and don't like about EVs. And then this, this example on the right here of helping people navigate the very complex EV tax credit landscape in as simplified a manner as we can. This is an example of something that we'll be playing this role at the Denver Auto Show, trying to talk with people about how do you figure out what you're eligible for? How might that affect your decision to get an EV in the future? Uh, all of that. And then the last category that I'll talk about today is zero emission vehicle workforce development. And this is something that you might not think of initially when it comes to this, this EV campaign, but um, you know, as you talk with transit fleets, municipal fleets, commercial vehicles, dealers, all of them ask these questions of, you know, if I were to get an EV or a zero emission vehicle, who would repair it? Who would maintain it? Are there people to do that? Are there people being trained to do that? And uh, so we've, we've stepped into this space. We've reached out to some of our partners, like the Colorado Community College System, Department of Labor and Employment, Workforce Development Council, and we're starting to help uh, move this forward. Uh, we worked with a group called the Rocky Mountain Auto Teacher Society. These are the instructors at most of the community colleges and technical schools to develop a new course, ASE 2210, which will be focused exclusively on hybrid and BEV Battery, hybrid electric vehicle and battery electric vehicle safety and operations. This will be a course that gets integrated into the auto tech curriculum at four community colleges starting later this fall and then hopefully eventually all of them. And we, we hope that that grows into multiple courses or even a certificate so that new people coming out with an auto tech background are learning these topics from day one and they're prepared to work on a variety of vehicles. Uh, we're also, we partner with General Motors and the National Renewable Energy Lab to bring a first responder training to the state so that 200 CDOT staff, local traffic incident management professionals, police, fire, 
EMT could learn how to safely interact with electric vehicles involved in a crash, how to deal with battery fires, how to uh, cut through a vehicle safely when there are high voltage components, and we hope to do more of that because our first responders are some of the people that are most likely to encounter these vehicles today, and we need to make sure that they're prepared to do so safely and effectively. And we've also created grand, brand new grant opportunities to help community colleges and other educational institutions purchase EV safety and training equipment, develop new curricula, share knowledge and best practices across the state. So that's another exciting new resource. Here's some photos of these types of activities, the courses, the online trainings. That uh, picture on the bottom right, that is the battery inside a Hummer EV. It is 3,000 pounds and it is very large and very intimidating. And so looking at what that involves and how you can deal with that in an emergency situation before you're out there on the road figuring it out for the first time. So the last thing I'll mention, we have the Colorado Electric Vehicle Plan. The last version was in, 2020, was in 2020. It's currently being updated for 2023, refreshing some of our existing targets, also charting the direction for the next couple of years for the state. You can see some of the categories. We have a greater in, in, um, emphasis on e-bikes and shared mobility this time around, more medium and heavy duty vehicle infrastructure, and more of the cross-cutting themes of equity, workforce development, data collection, and those sorts of things. So I encourage you to look at that. Um, it should be released in April of this year. And finally, just a pitch, we've already talked about some of the grant funding programs. These, these three enterprises were created by Senate Bill 260 back in 2021. Uh, each of these is 10 years of state funding. Um, the, the 10 years are represented at the bottom, but the enterprises will uh, continue as long as they remain in statute. But you can see some really significant amounts of state-level funding that will be available over the next decade to help build charging, support e-bike adoption, uh, in the case of the Clean Fleet Enterprise, school buses, transportation network companies, and then the Clean Transit Enterprise here at CDOT. Um, it's so important because not only is it a significant sum of money, it's also reliably uh, available for the next 10 years. There's no cliff where it will disappear. And these funds can be used to match federal competitive funds. So when we compete with other states for that pot of federal money, in Colorado we have the ability to match and leverage, whereas other states are going to be wholly reliant on federal resources. So with that, I will wrap up and open it to questions and discussion, and I apologize if I inundated you with a, a lot of uh, information there, but there's a lot going on, and uh, we're just really excited to, to share and to hear your feedback on uh, what you'd like to see more of, how we can work with Dr. Cog and the, the member communities, and uh, what should we be creating in the future that doesn't exist yet. So with that, I will... Um, I will pause and open it up, uh, Jacob or Emily, if you want to moderate questions, however you like to do it. Thank you, Mr. King. Appreciate that presentation. Um, do we have any questions or comments from the PAC? Madam Chair, Matt House, Matt House <laughs> I, has yes. his <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't have my list uh, right there. Uh, Mr. McAllison, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair uh, Grant. Uh, thank you, Jacob, on that. Uh, appreciate the presentation, Michael, uh, on this. Uh, question in terms of the um, uh, coverage area. Coverage is one on, on the charging side of things, but also is there an industry or a, a, a thought in terms of what constitutes a an appropriate metric, if you will, in terms of number of units provided given the market um, presence of, of EVs? Yes, so obviously all of this is still being developed because it's a new industry. And so it remains to be determined what is the quote unquote right number of chargers that you need to support the whole fleet. Um, currently, about 80% of EV charging occurs at home. Um, so that would indicate that you actually need fewer public chargers than you do just universal access for people that have garages. 
But of course, there are lots of folks that don't have access to garages or dedicated parking. And there's also the fact that currently the early adopters of EVs are disproportionately higher income, so they have the ability to charge at home. Uh, the Energy Office and some of our other state partners will regularly do uh, market analyses with third parties that try to answer these questions. So we have a light duty charging infrastructure gap analysis that was done about two years ago that gives us a, a ballpark number of DC fast chargers and level two chargers that they feel are needed in each county of Colorado in order to support uh, the adoption goals that we currently have. Just recently, they completed a similar analysis for the medium and heavy duty space. And I'd be happy to share both of those with, uh, with Dr. Cog and with the communities to you know, get a sense of what is the target number of units and where would they be distributed around the state. But of course, I will again point out that in reality, nobody really knows yet because it is an emerging market and people's behavior is changing. So we think we have an idea of the right number um, and the, the cost associated with that, but it, they are just estimates and we're constantly refining them. Yeah, I appreciate that, Michael. You know, one approach may be looking at ranges with the assumptions on the absorption and, and presence throughout the fleets, obviously. And it may also vary uh, differently in, in, in rural areas, uh, certainly than in metroplexes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, one additional follow-up question uh, is uh, your general schedule for completing the scenic byway uh, yeah. uh, charging fitting? Yes, yeah, so our, um, our target, I believe, is to have all of them built out by 2032. I, I'd have to check that for you. Um, we have, our goal is 80% by the... Um, no, excuse me, I'm, I'm confusing my numbers. Our goal is to have 18 by June 30th of 2023, and I believe that we get to full build out by 2026. Um, one of the things that we as the state are looking at for that charging and fueling infrastructure grant that I mentioned, the, comp the nationally competitive one, is whether we can bundle a number of the scenic byways in a certain region and propose that as a project to be funded with federal money. And if we were to win that, I think it would accelerate our timeline significantly. But at the moment, we're seeing, uh, I would say, two to three every six months that, uh, based on the definition of electrified as we've determined it, that, that flip over into that category. Um, okay. I will say one thing about the Byways program is that we've been working with the Colorado Tourism Office on this. And that's been tremendously valuable because once we achieve an electrified byway, the tourism office has been very effective at promoting this nationally. We've had articles in the New York Times and Lonely Planet. And so not only is it helping those local communities, but um, we're getting some kind of national attention in terms of the idea of Colorado as a zero emission tourism destination, that you could fly into Den, you could rent an electric vehicle, and you could spend your entire trip to Colorado uh, emitting zero emissions while traveling. And I think that there is a market for that, both nationally and internationally. So this is one where the transportation piece of it is in important, but it's also economic development and, and international trade. Thank you, Michael, for that. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Katzer. Yes, Michael, thank you for the presentation. I had a question on the DC fast charging stations. Um, does okay. CDOT own those? And just could you give a little more detail on, on if you do own them, kind of um, what, what that what that's taken CDOT to do? And then how do you get the money back to you charge for the electricity? And how do you determine those rates? Just so those details would be great. Yes, thank you. Um, the, CDOT and the state of Colorado do not own or operate any chargers, including DC fast chargers. Uh, the exception to that is at our CDOT facilities for our own fleet, for our employees, and for our visitors. Everything you see on this map is owned and operated by, in most part, private companies. In some cases, local governments, electric utilities, or a nonprofit entity of some sort. 
So the, the program is designed to offset the higher end installation cost of, of building these out, purchasing the equipment. And then some entities uh, seek to recoup their costs through fees on the electricity. Uh, other entities treat them as a loss leader and they make up the difference on retail. For instance, you know, Target or King Supers is not really trying to turn a profit on electricity. They just want you to spend a half an hour in the building. And if you're anything like me, you spend $100 in Target in that half an hour, right? So um, there are some best practices in terms of the rate structures, uh, but those rate structures are also heavily influenced by the local electric utility. So XL Energy has an EV friendly rate that they've established specifically for EV charging. There are other parts of the state where that does not exist and you might be paying an industrial rate or a residential rate or a commercial rate that doesn't really align very well with the actual business model of fast charging, particularly when it comes to demand charges. And that can be a real make or break from an economic standpoint. So one of the things at the state that we do is work with the utilities to understand how their existing structures, where they've been designed and built over a century to do a certain set of things, uh, do and don't align very well with transportation electrification and how uh, they and the transportation community can maybe adjust some of our existing systems and policies to better work together and align. Um, but if you're interested in what is the right rate that I should set on the charger that I own, um, there are best practices and there, there's guidance that we can provide from the Colorado Energy Office. And that's something that we do with any grant is we ask, what is your intention in terms of charging for electricity? How do you plan to set that rate? Uh, sometimes if somebody proposes something that we think is not necessarily a good fit, we can advise them, but it is ultimately up to the site host to make that determination. Great, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions or comments for Mr. King? Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. King, for this wonderful oh, presentation. Chair, uh, oh. Sorry, Alex oh. Hyde-Wright has his hand up. Apologies. Mr. Hyde-Wright. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. I just had a couple questions. Um, one is, how does this program align with supporting electrification for multifamily developments like condos and apartments? Um, and then are there more incentives or more generous grants for chargers that are going to be publicly available uh, versus on private property for exclusive use of the property owner? Great. Yes, great question. So I'll, I'll answer the second part first, I think. Um, generally speaking, with some minor exceptions, the state will only fund charging that is publicly accessible. Um, now, the exceptions there are if you are a, for instance, a municipal fleet or a transit fleet, and you have a behind the fence fueling and charging scenario, that is something that we can support, albeit at a different rate. Um, for things like multifamily housing uh, or workplaces, we often do consider that to be publicly accessible, even if it's not accessible to every member of the public. The distinction being that it can't be reserved for a single individual or a very small number of individuals, but a shared lot at a multifamily building or a shared lot at a workplace is usually considered publicly accessible. Um, and then in terms of addressing multifamily housing, so currently a lot of those projects come through the Charge Ahead Colorado program. Uh, they tend to be level two chargers because those align very well with parking overnight. So if you're a resident of one of those buildings and you're able to charge overnight, uh, that is the lowest cost, most effective solution. The challenge with multifamily housing is that the owner of the building often has different incentives than the residents of the building. The owner would be spending money to invest, potentially covering some of the electrical fees. And it's just the, the person that benefits from that is usually the, the homeowner or the renter, uh, but they're not able to make that decision on behalf of the building. One of the other ways that we can address that is that the DC Fast Charging Plazas program includes public facing charging that is in denser urban areas without uh, access to parking or garages. So in an area with more apartment buildings, some sort of uh, charging hub for uh, fast charging of people that need to have more of a gas 
station experience and can't charge overnight, or potentially also things like overnight charging lots, even uh, curbside charging, as we see in some cities in Europe and beginning now in Los Angeles and Seattle. So um, all of those things can be addressed, but there are some uh, sort of sticky challenges just in terms of the incentives do not always line up for multifamily housing to provide charging, uh, whereas most of the time if you are a business or you are a fleet, you capture all the benefits of installing charging, whereas a building owner may not. And if the building owner does see the value in installing charging, unfortunately, it may be that they are now able to rent their apartments for a higher rate, which could create a gentrification and displacement issue. So we also want to be careful about how do we provide charging in neighborhoods that are currently underserved without, um, without um, unintentionally pushing people out of those neighborhoods by making them more attractive with some new urban amenity. So it is a tricky issue. We're, we're open to, to good ideas about how to solve it. But right now we have funding. Uh, we need to, I think, figure out a, a more cohesive strategy around the funding to make sure that we're getting the results we want from that. Thanks. And then uh, one last question. Uh, in my neighborhood, where a lot of houses don't have garages, you see EVs parked on the street and then the extension cord draped across the sidewalk, uh, which yeah. introduced yet another hurdle for folks walking and biking, particularly people with disabilities. I don't know if there's a role for the state in that, but wondering as EVs proliferate in a variety of residential contexts, what should governments be doing about that phenomenon? Now, that, that is a great example of uh, sort of unintended side effect of, of this transition. And yeah, I, I kind of indicated this at the, at the top, but I think it's important to reiterate that electrification of privately owned automobiles is a necessary, but by no means sufficient step in addressing our GHG uh, reduction targets and our mobility needs. And anything that prioritizes automobile travel over access for pedestrians, uh, people with disabilities, bikes and scooters uh, is, not, is not a positive. We need to address both of these things at once. So in the example that you cite, I mean, I'm not sure what the role of the state is with that other than encouraging local municipalities to enforce uh, prohibitions on, on things that are blocking the sidewalk. I think that local governments can work with the state potentially to install more curbside charging so that that sort of situation is not necessary for people to have cords traveling across the sidewalks, but rather the, the charging infrastructure is at the curb and minimizing the disruption. Um, and then, of course, things like shared uh, EV fleets, electric car share, electric scooters, electric bikes so that perhaps fewer people need to have a personally privately owned automobile that is charging. Um, so, you know, I don't know that there's one single solution there. We have in the past seen legislation that prevents non-EV users from parking in EV charging spots, taking up those chargers um, because it is, you know, detrimental to the overall transition. And, a similar set of regulations or rules that prevent EV users from abusing the transportation environment around them, I think is also appropriate. But as to the specifics, I think that's going to be something that we all figure out together moving forward. Thanks. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? seeing none. Thank you, Mr. King. Thank you for coming and presenting to us today. This is a very informative presentation. Really great to see all the investments that the state is making and the equitable distribution or, and the strategy around that throughout the state. And really wonderful to see the implementation of SB 260 funding moving forward. And thank you for bringing us the opportunity for the new federal program. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, and, and please, everyone, feel free to reach out with any questions or, or further conversation. We, we're always happy to talk with our local partners. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. 
Uh, item number six, the RTD system-wide fair study and equity analysis. This is attachment D in your packet. I'll turn it over to Jacob Rieger to introduce this presentation. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Just a brief introduction. I'll defer to uh, Bill Soroy at RTD, but um, I think you all know that RTD has been working on system-wide fair study and equity analysis uh, for many months now. A lot of hard work has gone into this. Um, they've put out a couple options for public comment. Um, in terms of alternatives, they're getting close to the end of uh, taking final action on this study and this work. So we thought it was really timely uh, for you all to hear a little bit more detail about this effort. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill Saroy. Thanks, Jacob. And give me two seconds here to share my screen. Um, and hopefully when I get it up, uh, whoops. Let's see here. All right. Is it showing correctly? Uh, we see it, but it's not in presentation mode yet. Okay, let me just see because I was worried about this. Not as used to Zoom. There we go. Okay, and then, okay, is that better? I... We are not seeing it yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, this is exactly why I was. Okay, let me try another one here. Um... Looks good. Yep. Looks good now, you can see it? Okay. Yes. yes. And is it in presentation mode? It is. Okay. Sorry, sorry about that. I'm not as used to Zoom as as um, uh, Teams and a few other things. Uh, thanks, Jacob. Again, this is Bill Saroy, uh, Senior Manager of Transit Oriented Communities at RTD, is and part of the project management team for the System Wide Fair Study and Equity Analysis. Um, so we are um, kind of in the final phase of this effort. Um, this uh, really started last spring um, and was initiated um, by our uh, general manager. Um, let's see here, I'm just trying to think here. There we go. Is it is it, are the slides advancing? Just want to make sure. Yes, yes they are. are. Okay, thanks. Um, so with this effort, um, you know, we started out with three primary goals and it was related to a lot of the feedback that we were hearing you know previously which was that the fares were too high and they were too complicated so um in looking at this one of the things you know that really stood out um and was has been a priority for our general manager is equity and making sure that our most financially burdened customers are benefiting from anything that we look at in terms of fares so that was a, a again a, a very much a primary goal. Also related to the to the feedback we've heard, both affordability and simplicity were important to address kind of what we were hearing from our um, customers in particular about our fares and our fare structure. So um, this slide is meant to highlight the, the, the timeline. Um, with this, um, like I said, we are entering our final stage of the um, effort. We have gone through three um, robust kind of milestone periods where we had extensive customer feedback, starting with last spring um, and leading it to today, which I'm gonna talk about the, the recommendations um, that we are bringing forth and that we will be going out to the public with uh, primarily towards the end of April and May. Um, so just a little bit about um, our last milestone um, and the feedback that we heard. We, we did a very extensive outreach effort in this milestone last fall, um, had a major online survey that provided a lot of good um, feedback in terms of the two alternatives that we threw out for people to react to. Um, we also had a series of customer and community meetings um, some of them exclusively in Spanish. Um, we we um, worked for the first time with um, some community-based organizations and, and actually have hired them as part of this process to do outreach for us. 
This is a new thing for RTD that we're really excited about. And I think this is going to be a, a model that we plan to use on other major efforts like this in the future. Um, and then some of you on the on the TAC, I know we're involved in some of our feedback panels. We had a jurisdiction feedback panel, an equity feedback panel, and a past program feedback panel, um, which were really used to take some of the feedback that we're hearing from our customers and community and trying to help us and to kind of turn that into, you know, how do we use it and how do we take that and make mold it into, you know, a recommendation. Um, and like I said, we did have a series that we had an online, an online survey. Um, we also had a community-based survey as well. So we, again, we had a, a very extensive outreach process throughout um, this last phase and throughout the project in general. So just as a reminder, and I know many of you have seen this, um, but when we went out in this last last round, last fall, we had two alternatives that we threw out for people to react to. Um, alternative A, which was really focused on um, affordability and, and equity in terms of lowering the fare for everyone across the board. Um, so it basically took our existing fare structure and basically lowered the fare um, for all categories. Um, with an emphasis, you know, primarily, uh, you know, on trying to look at, at the monthly pass in particular and taking some advantage of, of fare capping um, that we that we have in place now. Alternative B was a little bit different approach, really focused on simplicity. It focused on eliminating um, the regional or combining local and regional fares into one and getting rid of the zones that men, it, we've heard a lot of feedback about, um, you know, concerns and, and how complicated it is. It also uh, simplifies things from giving one basically monthly pass price, um, but does keep the airport um, fare kind of at, at a premium. So throughout um, that um, feedback period, um, we heard a lot of support for B. Um, basically, that that was the over well overall preferred um, site, preferred alternative by the majority of people that um, we heard from. But we did hear from a series of, of folks about Alternative A, and particularly those folks that primarily use the local fare, and that that they wanted to see a lowering of the local fare because under the under the, the kind of the Alternative B that we had thrown out to the public, it did not um, incorporate any kind of um, lowered local fare. So based on that feedback, is where we kind of come into our current proposed fare structure. So. Here we go with um, the, the second there, uh, the, the, what we are proposing um, and we plan to take out to the public um, starting uh, next month is um, basically having a lowered, a combined local and regional fare at 275 for a three hour pass and 550 for a day pass and having a monthly pass of 88 bucks um, and then on the airport side, we're lowering fares a little bit from 10, 50 to 10. And then um, on the discount fare side, um, we are simplifying things greatly in that we're having one price, single price for all, across all discount categories, um, including um, the LIV program, which previously had a different discount, um, a 40% discount, which I'll get to in a second, compared to um, people with disabilities and um, older adults over 65. So that is, a, again, a great simplification from where we were. Then if you look, uh, drill down a little bit of the airport fare, uh, one of the things that we heard consistently from many of our airport customers is how high the fare was to the airport and particularly for employees. So one of the things that we did with this is making sure that that monthly pass was um, much more affordable for the employee. So you can see it went from $200 a month to 88, over well over a 50% decrease. Um, so that is going to be a tremendous benefit, um, we think, for the workforce out at DIA. Um, and then on the discount side, um, you can see that that we, in terms of the changes that, you know, those that are in one of those discount categories, they will play a single fare to go to the airport. Again, you know, if they're going to be doing it as uh, just a, a, a one-way trip, it's a dollar thirty-five a round trip, two seventy, and then if they get a monthly pass, they can do it for twenty-seven bucks a month. 
So again, very a very deep discount for those um, in the discount fare category. And on the accessoride side, we kind of took the same approach that we did across the, the, the standard fare structure and looked to lower um, accessoride fares um, kind of correspondingly. So they go down from five to 450 with a, com a combination of com combining the local and regional fares. And then similarly on the airport fare goes down slightly. Um, but the new thing that we are adding um, that we did hear feedback on is actually making um, the accessoride fares live eligible and, and eligible for the live discount. So you can see on the, the right here, kind of the proposed fares for those that qualify for the live discount, um, which is basically um, those have an income uh, commensurate with our thresholds. Um, and I'll get to those just in here in just one second. Um, so we did have another series of program changes, which we think are gonna greatly benefit our customer base. And I'll go over those here. Um, so with the LIV program particularly, um, we are proposing to increase the discount from 40 to 50% to align with the other discount fares as I, as I identified before. We're also proposing to increase the threshold on um, the incomes from 185% of poverty level to 250%, which, the 250% actually lines up fairly well with the standard minimum wage, um, you know, in Denver and in the region, um, which we're kind of excited about. The 185% was, we did hear complaints that it wasn't broad enough. Um, and this does put RTD kind of at the top of the heap in terms of um, the the income category, you know, the income threshold across, the, across our peers, across the country. Um, I think that the only other peer agency that's looking at something, anything close to this is Seattle, which may be looking at up to a 300%, but I think everybody else is well below the 250. Um, so we we also plan to, to conduct uh, a much more outreach on the LIVE program. I think we did hear a lot from many customers that they didn't know about it. And again, you know, that's something that we need to work on. And then lastly, we need to expand, work on expanding means testing. Right now we do means testing through the state's peak system. And we wanna look for ways to make that easier for people. Another, that's another point of um, feedback that we did here about you know, the, the daunting nature of trying to get into the peak and, and work to get registered under the peak system. And so we're gonna work on that piece as well. Um, then on the current pass programs, EcoPass, NicoPass, and College Pass, we're looking to create some a little bit more pr predictability. We did hear some concern over the kind of the the varied nature of pricing over the past several years, the up and down nature of that, and we're going to look to hopefully stem that by creating a two-year um, contract versus a, an annual contract, um, the, and reduce lower uh, the contract minimums to reduce participation barriers. And, and then um, this will not be available to as a bulk discount, which is another piece that we're looking at. And then the other piece on the EcoPass side in particular, we are greatly simplifying the pricing matrix, which had previously or currently has about 16 different price points that you can potentially qualify under. Um, and now we're gonna reduce that down to I think three or four. So greatly simplifying that. Um, other things that we have under consideration, probably the, the biggest of which is the first one, the Zero Fare for Youth pilot program. That would be um, free fares for youth um, under those under 19 and under. Um, and we are working to kind of develop some of the, the, the details of that program in particular. They're not quite all together yet, but again, our main goal is we, we wanna try this in a pilot program. Um, it could be an 18 month or 12 month pilot, uh, more likely 18 months, where we would um, allow use to ride for free with the idea that that's a fairly significant burden on the agency that we want to look for funding partners to help, um, you know, meet the kind of the, the reduced uh, transit or fare revenue that we're, uh, that's going to be a hit for the agency on. And then, um, so that's gonna be a big one. And, and that does have a fairly big increase in ridership and does go along with a lot of what we've done in the zero fare for better air program 
um, you know, that we implemented last summer and we hope to do this again this summer. Um, and then we are going to reintroduce a bulk purchase program. Um, many of you remember the Flex Pass. This is similar. Um, there will be a 10% uh, discount for bulk purchases over $1,500. So again, many, you know, different kind of groups can take advantage of that. Those that maybe aren't, um, don't think the EcoPass or some of the pass programs are for them. This is a way for them to get a little bit cheaper fare media. Um, the next one, actually, I'm, I'm very excited about. It's the Transit Assistance Grant Program. This is really targeted towards nonprofits that really serve um, clients with immediate needs, um, those people that need, you know, fair media right away and don't have the ability to kind of sign up for the live program and and go through the whole peak process, but they need fair media to get to a hotel or to get to a job interview or something of that nature. And we want to establish a grant program that um, qualified nonprofits could apply for um, to get free fair, fair media. So that is something that we are going to be um, proposing. We are proposing as well. And lastly, um, many um, kind of higher ed institutions. Um, don't participate in the college pass program because it's an all in program. So it's a, it's a big, um, you know, initiative to do that. Um, this program is going to be for some of the community colleges and for the other higher ed institutions that might not want to participate in college pass as to do a semester pass. And this is basically going to be a 20% discount on a semester basis um, that those kind of institutions will be able to take advantage of. So that highlights kind of the other steps. So kind of where are we at in the next steps? So we will be going to our board uh, next month um, and outlining this and basically saying that we will be planning to release these to the public kind of shortly thereafter um, the, uh, the presentation of the board. And then our, our review period is really gonna focus on, like I said, the end of April and May. We have a series of um, public hearings that we will be advertising. We are working on scheduling a series of other events um, at facilities and at festivals and other active um, cultural events that will be happening. Um, we will be having a uh, our uh, community-based partners going out and you know soliciting feedback on these fair um, policies, and then you know we will be available for uh, again various groups to to present to um, over the course of that period. Then the expectation is that, you know, following that, we'll summarize the comments and take um, a final recommendation of the board in July. Um, so that would go through the July board cycle. And then assuming the board would approve a new fair structure, those those would be the, the new recommended fair structure would be implemented in the first quarter of next year. Um, so that we, it does take us a, a little while to ramp up in order to get, you know, to change our fair um, equipment and print new fair media and all the other things that we have to do in order to implement that fair change. So um, with that, that is the end of my presentation. So I will, I'm going to stop sharing just because it's easier for me to see people and respond to questions when I don't have my screen up. So with that, I will open it up for any questions that folks may have. Great. Thank you, Mr. Shroy. Thank you for that presentation. Do we have any questions from the DAC? I am not seeing any hands. Oh, there we go, Mr. Pilgrim. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, hello, Bill. Uh, very impressive uh, program, and um, I, I think it's it's a uh, a terrific step in the right direction. I, I, <laughs> I'm just wondering uh, why can't we do this sooner? This is a, I mean, this is a good news thing, and uh, you know, I, I think RTD needs to be uh, highly credited for you know, a, a, a big step forward. And I, I think it's gonna be a benefit uh, to the whole region and a, a real stimulus to get people back in transit. So I, I know it's it's gotta be programmed, but uh, I think it's terrific. And, 
and hopefully we can start to, uh, you know, to RTD's horn for doing something that's that's very um, inclusive and timely. Thanks. Yeah, and, and you know, we we will. I'm sure, and I, I know our general manager is very interested in doing things sooner. Um, I think we just have to balance that with what we can do, you know, feasibly. And, and, you know, there may be some elements of this that we could do sooner. I think we'll have to go have more conversations over the next couple of months about what we can and can't do. Yeah, I, I know that since she's been here, she's been a big, big advocate for moving forward on this. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Art, looks like you have your hand up. Yeah, um, so it's kind of late in the game, but did you guys give it any thought to like those three hour rates versus like a four hour rate? I mean, yeah, well, just, um, you know, three seems pretty tight and I well, late it, in the game bringing that up. <laughs> right. it, this actually did come up during our process um, because there was some question about the three hour rate. Let me just back up and tell you what the purpose of the three hour rate. So the three hour rate is really intended to address a one way trip in our system. So basically, According to our service planners, a three hours is the longest one-way trip that you can make on an RTD service. So that is what it's intended to do. Now, what it does do for some people that do make shorter trips, it, you can do a round trip in that three hours, but that's not the intent. You're not, it's not the intent to be able to go you know, and do a round trip. It's the intent is really to be able to make sure that we're serving those people that have a longer one-way trip. So it is something that, again, we did hear about. And again, we don't want to clarify what the purpose of that three-hour trip is for, or the three-hour pass is for. Yeah, that's that's helps. The two factors that I was thinking about for a four-hour trip was um, some services um, impacted because of labor shortage or things like that, other issues. But the other one was attracting people that may make a short trip, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I think one extra hour um, would allow some short trips. Thanks, Bill. Mr. Priest. Go ahead, sorry. Sorry, Bill, cut you off there. Thanks for um, the presentation and thanks, Madam Chair, for giving me a chance to ask a quick question. I know it's in the, the works here uh, at RTD. Is there any indication for what the cutoff for bulk might mean? What does that number look like for the discount, that 10% proposed discount? Well, yeah, so it's it's gonna be $1,500 is gonna be the threshold, I think, for bulk purchases. That's what we're looking at. Perfect, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hudson? Yeah, Bill, I was just curious, and I apologize if I missed a slide. What does this mean revenue-wise for RTD? I mean, cutting rates is great, but I know you guys are having revenue issues with the, since the pandemic. Just curious. Thank you. Yeah, no, and I didn't include my revenue slide in this, but I probably should have. Um, so what this does mean, it does mean reduce revenues. I think the thing that we determined early on in this effort is we work with our CFO, um, Doug McLeod, to adjust our fair revenue expectations moving forward in our midterm financial plan. Um, so there, it's embedded in our midterm financial plan, a reduction in fair revenue. And, and that paired with the fact that fair revenue as a percentage of our overall revenue has gone significantly down since the pandemic. Used to be um, that we were in the 15 to 20% range in terms of the percent of our revenue that came from fares. Now it's in the eight to 10, eight to 12 percent range. Um, so it has actually gone down pretty significantly in terms of a source of revenue. Um, so with that being said, one of the other factors that we um, heard loudly um, in this effort was we don't want you to cut revenue to the point where it affects service. And so we have confirmed that for the life of the midterm financial plan, which is now through 2027, we have no impacts on 
proposed service levels consistent with the system optimization plan. So we think we're covered um, in terms of, of the budget issues. Now, longer term, certainly we're, you know, with fair fairs, we try to look at them every few years. We could be in a conversation in four or five years of looking at, you know, a change in fares again. But for the foreseeable future, we think that we are safe um, from in terms of budget impacts. Thank you. Mr. Silverstein. Hi, everyone, and, and thank you, William. A, a question about fare collection, um, especially for light rail. Um, does your, you know, the, the new thinking um, evaluate how to better ensure that people actually pay to ride? Where with the current light rail design at the stations, it's you know jumping on and off, and there isn't a, you know any sort of gate or or um, in, you know any way to ensure people actually pay to ride. Could you um, talk about that? Sure. Um, you know, with our system, we we have what's called an open system, um, and you know we we're not like systems like in DC or you know if you ever ride BART in San Francisco where you know you have to go through a fare gate in order to get access to the service um you know lately i know that's been more of an issue traditionally if you look at or historically if you look in the past we've had a 90 mid 90s for in terms of fare evasion rate meaning that only 4 or 5% of our customers aren't paying um, I'm, I'm assuming those numbers have gone up recently. Uh, I can't confirm that though, but well, one of the things we are doing to address that, and many of you probably have seen and heard about our new approach for security and our system and the fact that we are hiring a completely new, um, police force where RTD is going to be more geographically based. Um, and we think that that's going to help with some of the um, security concerns that we've heard a lot about over the last couple of years. Um, and so we are working on that piece of it. So, and they, they will be one of the ones that will be helping to full in, enforce um, fares on our, on our vehicles. So we, um, you know, are excited about that piece of it kind of moving forward. Great, thank you. Any further questions or comments for Mr. Soroy? Well, thank you very much for that presentation, Mr. Soroy. I really appreciate you bringing this to the Dr. Cog TAC, and it really seems like a strong step in the right direction. And um, the new outreach techniques that RTD deployed is really appreciated, all the different languages using community-based organizations to reach into the community. Really appreciate the effort. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we have our administrative items. Um, so I will hand it over to Carson Priest. If you have any updates on the AMP working group. Thanks, Madam Chair. I do not have an AMP working group as we had our March meeting canceled, but I think we'll have one here in the next month or two. Great, thank you. Um, I think, Ron, do you have a couple of updates for us before we close out, or Jacob? Actually, yes, I do, Madam Chair. Thanks very much. Um, I'm actually going to share my screen, if you'll give me a second to do that. Just wanted to, oh, sorry, if we could unshare uh, the agenda. Thank you. Um, just wanted to give folks a reminder about our Dr. Cog Awards. Hopefully you all are seeing my, uh, my screen now, our Dr. Cog 2023 Annual Awards. Hopefully you all have heard about this already. I've gotten the solicitations from us. This is the page that we've set on our website. This is directly linked from our homepage. Um, our MetroVision Awards this year are due Friday, April 14th um, in several categories. We have our MetroVision Awards uh, category, which themselves um, incorporate several aspects consistent with our MetroVision plan, um, our John B. Christensen Memorial Award, and our Way to Go uh, kind of commuter, um, both commuting and uh, commuter and employee and employer awards as well. Um, so several categories for our awards, but they're all due April 14th. Uh, so just wanted to remind folks of that. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Rieger. Any other updates from members?
Okay, seeing none. Um, our next TAC meeting will be April 24th, 2023, and we will adjourn our meeting at 2.56 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.